Welcome to the France 24 debate. The fallout over the drone attacks on Saudi oil installations continues. Petrol price rises are predicted to be imposed very quickly at the pumps as world oil production is badly disrupted. Now, the U.S. President Donald Trump was the first to react and he instantly blamed uh, Iran for the situation, tweeting that the U.S. was locked and loaded, a phrase that uh, had many people uh, twitching, implying he's ready to retaliate in a military fashion against the Iranians. <clears throat> Iran denied being behind the attack. Uh, the attack has actually been claimed by the Houthi rebels from Yemen. They are supported by the Iranians. The Houthis uh, have said, uh, adding to this, they are ready to attack again. Well, this Monday, the U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, says he has information which confirms Iraq's denial that its territory was used to launch the attack. You see how this story is spreading and spreading with its uh, influence. Russia, another name being brought into the uh, equation, has spoken out to condemn the strikes, but also to say... Uh, not be hasty in blaming the Iranians. The attack on Saturday halted production of 5.7 million barrels of crude a day. This represents more than half of Saudi Arabia's global daily exports. A return to normal production could take some two months. As a result, Brent crude has hit its highest percentage price rise since the run-up to the Gulf War in 1991. And that figure is something like a 10% rise. Uh, in uh, the price of uh, Brent crude, and that uh, will, of course, be passed on to the consumer at some time, I can predict, fairly soon. Let's uh, introduce you uh, to our guests uh, for this uh, debate here at France 24. Here in the studio, Julien Daon, who's consultant in international security, lecturer at International Conflicts in Sciences Po, and associate researcher at CAREP here in Paris. Julien, thank you very much indeed for joining us as wow. ever. Joining us uh, from afar, we have three guests uh, in no order of preference here. This is just how it fell on my studio notes. By studio, uh, by in studio, in Tel Aviv rather, Offer Bronstein, who's president of uh, International Center for Peace in the Middle East. Offer, thanks for being with us. Joining us uh, in the studio in Tehran, Syed Mustafa uh, Koshishim, who's a professor of journalism at the Fars Media Faculty at the Applied Sciences University. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And joining us by Skype from Washington, Fatima Abo Alasra, who's a senior analyst at the Middle East Foundation. Thank you, too, for being with us. I'll let you loose in a moment to discuss everything related to this story. But first, a roundup from our reporter here at France 24, Alison Sargent. Half of Saudi Arabia's oil production up in smoke after the drone attacks targeting its largest processing plant and a major oil field. The kingdom's energy minister confirmed they've had to slash production by 50 percent, the equivalent of 5 percent of the world's oil supply. The minister stressed that these attacks are not only aimed at the vital installations of Saudi Arabia, but also at the global oil supply and its security, thus posing a threat to the global economy. The attacks were claimed by Yemen's Houthi rebels, who are backed by Iran. They said it was retaliation for Saudi Arabia's intervention in Yemen, where since 2015 the kingdom has been leading a coalition fighting against them. In recent months, the Houthis have carried out a series of drone and missile attacks on airports and oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. But U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo directly blamed Iran for the bombings. Tehran is behind nearly 100 attacks on Saudi Arabia, while Rouhani and Zarif pretend to engage in diplomacy. Amid all the calls for de-escalation, Iran has now launched an unprecedented attack on the world's energy supply. There is no evidence the attacks came from Yemen. Saudi Arabia's northern neighbor, Iraq, has denied suggestions that the drones were launched from pro-Iranian forces on their territory. Iran, meanwhile, responded to the U.S. accusations, calling them blind and meaningless. Alison Sargent and uh, Cole Stangler with uh, that roundup. Let's begin our uh, debate uh, by bringing in Fatima Abu Alasra, a senior analyst at the Middle East Foundation, joining us live from Washington. Fatima, I hope you, you can hear us. We're having some problems with other guests. We'll bring them in as and when we're sure we can connect to them. But I know I can see you now. It's great. And I hope you can hear me. In, in terms of what uh, Donald Trump has said about being locked and loaded, I mean, clearly that made lots of people sit up and take notice and be concerned about what might happen next. Do you think the president might, uh, well, might revise what he said?
live television uh, is uh, a very unpredictable animal at times. We will bring in uh, Fatima when we have uh, a clear uh, link to her and we can hear what she says. I'd be interested to get her reply to Let's bring in Julian Theron, who's with us in the studio. And as I can see you, I know I can hear you, sir. Um, can I put the same question to you? When Donald Trump came out with that phrase, locked and loaded, I mean, certainly I said it and thought, good heavens, what does he mean? It's a bit complicated for Donald Trump because indeed, like you uh, underlined it, locked and loaded, it's a kind of threat, uh, mm -hmm. diplomatically speaking. It means that he's ready to act. The problem with Donald Trump and more generally uh, with the U.S. strategy with Iran is that uh, for a while uh, they had different options, uh, meaning, for instance, Barack Obama wanted to talk to Iran uh, uh, to reach an agreement on their nuclear uh, uh, program for uh, nuclear weapons. And in this respect, they allowed Iran to develop uh, what we call proxies, meaning usually non-state armed groups mm. throughout the region. Uh, a lot in Iraq, actually, and the Obama administration knew that uh, the pro-Iranian uh, groups were developing and so on, and later on in, in different places, uh, like Syria, for instance. Um, so it means that to reach this agreement uh, with the international community, the, uh, the Europeans, Russia, uh, the UN, uh, and the US, uh, Washington decided to let the Iranian influence in the region grow. On this, uh, Donald Trump has been elected, and then uh, he, he seized this occasion to actually retract from uh, the deal, meaning that all the Iranian influence that spread in the region, whether legitimate or not it is, that's not the question, but all this influence was actually for nothing then, because there was no deal anymore, because the US, well, the deal is still existing between, for instance, Iran and the Europeans, and there's complications on that. But uh, the US is now in a complicated situation, situation because it retracted from the deal and says, well, it's not possible to let Iran get an influence. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that Donald Trump said, so now we got a maximum pressure strategy on Iran and we put bad sanctions until Tehran goes back to the table on negotiation to have another deal. But the problem is that they reached some steps to say that we might actually strike Iran, but we knew that there was a couple of events that showed that Donald Trump might not be keen to strike Iran, actually, eventually. Because first, for instance, we remember that the UN sent a missile, and uh, strangely a bit, uh, Donald Trump uh, called the missile back, actually, said that, oh, he decided because of the uh, civilian casualties that he wouldn't go forth and so on, when usually, of course, you know know these kind of things before launching it. So we know that Donald Trump doesn't want that much to strike Iran for unknown reasons on these. And the other uh, element is that he actually fired uh, uh, John Bolton, who was the hardliner on Iran. So you see, he wants to play the hardline to uh, appear uh, unlike Barack Obama, that he disliked quite much. And in the, uh, on the other side, reaching Classical uh, uh, physical war mm. with Iran is a, is a bit tense, of course. Julian, thank you very much indeed. Let's bring in Fatima Abu uh, Alasra now, joining us uh, by Skype from Washington, senior analyst at the Middle East Foundation. Fatima, I hope you can uh, hear us now, and I hope most of all we can hear you because uh, your thoughts and opinions are, are what uh, this is all about. Um, Julian Theron there from uh, Carap here in Paris was uh, responding to the question I put to you earlier about um, locked and loaded, that phrase that Donald Trump used. Um, do you think if we could wind back the clock, Donald Trump maybe would have been advised to use different words? So much, so much of what's going on, uh, Mark, is about rhetoric because uh, no one can afford to take action here besides Iran. So uh, Trump is definitely has to offer what he can say right now, which is a strong stance against the belligerent attack that um, the Iran or its militias have conducted uh, overseas. Now, in terms of the action, I think this is where he's going to face problems, because uh, Trump does not have enough support in the United States to actually um, go ahead and uh, do something uh, uh, about the attacks, especially that he would be immediately perceived as uh, <coughs> protecting the Saudis in what could what looks like a regional um, uh, problem. Uh, but I think a lot of people uh, do not understand that it was the United States that actually 
led uh, in, in this escalation when it had cut the, the Iran deal and its regional allies in the Middle East are suffering the consequences. So I think at this stage, we're just going to see an escalation in rhetoric, but not necessarily in action. Fatima, bear with us. Quick reply from Julian. Yes, Mark, because uh, there might be one of or two elements, but I'm not completely sure that the US president is is turning toward this kind of strategy. But of course, there's the economical weapon, if we may say, but there's already some sanctions. And the civilian population, I mean, economic sanctions might work a bit, but it's also contested the efficiency. And for the Iranian uh, situation, I'm not completely sure that the Iranian population is going against the regime because of the US sanctions, or at least because of that. Indeed. And the other element, just the other element, is uh, there might be a weapon, uh, which is uh, cyber warfare. But it already existed, actually, uh, on uh, Iranian nuclear facilities. And actually, Iran struck back against Aramco in Saudi Arabia, as far as we uh, imagine that that uh, Iran did, um, meaning that they're also the side that actually might in both ways go to the software in itself and, and injure uh, the economy, the Iranian economy, but also going to the hardware, meaning the facilities uh, themselves, because when you reach the internet, you can provoke uh, physical casualties, of course. So that might be a way between not doing anything, just words, and attacking with classical uh, coercion weapons, it might be something in between like that. Just to remind everybody, the uh, Houthi rebels uh, from uh, Yemen are claiming resp responsibility for the attack. Uh, a Saudi military spokesman says the attack on the oil installations was carried out with Iranian weapons and didn't originate in Yemen. So uh, the plot, as ever with this one, is going to thicken and the layer upon layer of this story spreads out even further. Let's bring in uh, Offa Bronstein, who's joining us uh, from uh, Tel Aviv, president of the International Centre for Peace in the Middle East. And we all want peace in the Middle East. Offa, as ever, thank you, sir, for being with us. Um, Fatima Abu Alisra from the Middle East Foundation was talking about um, Donald Trump using uh, rhetoric, and that's all the only weapon he's got. Um, those words are used, lock and load. And I'm, I'm asking you this question, given you are in Tel Aviv and there are elections uh, in Israel coming up, and obviously Donald Trump's big friends with Benjamin Netanyahu. Was this a bit of electioneering on behalf of his friend, do you think? First of all, let me uh, tell you that I'm totally outraged. Why are we having this debate today? We are having this debate today because the Western world is going to be touched in its pocket, having the energy price and the oil price rising in the near future, while every day thousands of Yemenites are dying, of close to one million children are on the edge of starvation. A country like Yemen is being destroyed, but nobody cares. When it came to the price of oil, we all of a sudden, we all wake up and we are all uh, concerned by it. This is outraging. Now, uh, about the leadership in the region, you know, you have three kinds of leadership in the region. You have the bad one, the very bad one, and the very, very bad one. They are all pyramid. They are all playing with fire. You know when you start, you never know when it will end. And I'm very concerned. The Iranian regime is being squeezed. The American did not respect their deal. They did not respect something that they signed. The international community is trying as much as they can to stick to the deal signed with Iran a few years ago. I, uh, for President Rouhani and for the Iranian regime to declare in the last few days that they are willing to meet the president of Big Saturn. Since, uh, since the revolution in Iran in the 70s, the two main enemies of Iran was the Big Saturn, United States of America, and the small Saturn, Israel. For the regime, this regime, terrible regime, to accept a meeting with the leader of the Big Saturn, that means the Iranian regime is totally squeezed. The economical situation is catastrophic in, in Iran. Uh, the sanctions are having a very strong toll on the Iranian. The Israelis in the last few months are attacking Iranian presence in Syria and in Iraq. Uh, uh, this, we are in the edge of a very, very difficult situation. For the foreign minister of Iran to come to the G7, two weeks ago in, in France was a big step, knowing that the Americans are there. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful. And what I would like to see is for the international community. You know who is benefiting from all of that? 
not only the price uh, rising and whoever is selling oil, but whoever is selling weapons for the last years. The Russians are selling weapons, the Americans are selling weapons, the French are selling weapons. Everybody is selling weapons for millions of dollars, while the, the, uh, the people of the region are suffering, are starving, are dying. Enough, it's enough. One day, someone will ask us, where were you when it happened? I'm very afraid of what may happen in the next few days. We never know when this kind of fire can take us. It's time for the international community to be very firm and to stop it, to stop it. It's not only about money, it's not only about weapons, it's not only about interest, it's about people's life. So I, I, I hope that the UN, the European, the Russian who are meeting now, very Iranian, uh, uh, today with the Turkish, are going to uh, put pressure on the Iranian, on the Saudis, and to come down. We are on the edge of a catastrophe. I don't know what will happen in the next few days, and I'm very, very concerned. Offer Bronstein, thank you very much indeed. The only thing I would uh, take issue with was reporting of Yemen and, and just sort of blow our trumpet a little bit. We've reported extensively about the situation in Yemen, and we will continue to do so, and I agree with you. Uh, not enough can be said about a situation where so many people are at threat and so. losing their lives. Thank you. I completely agree with you on that, sir, completely. Um, that brings us to the end of part one of this debate. Short break, uh, news update, and then the rest. Part two to come. Stay with us. Welcome back to the France 24 debate, part two for you. We're discussing the uh, implications uh, after the attack on the Saudi uh, oil field. So world production has been uh, more or less halved with some 5.7 million barrels per day now not available and all prices set to rise. But the implications of this go far beyond the effect on people's pockets. And obviously the air of tension across the Middle East is that much thicker now in the light of what has happened, who's to blame and what uh, the bigger powers are saying about it. Here to discuss in the studio, Julien Theron, who's uh, the Associated Researcher at Carib here in Paris. Julien, thanks for being with us. We're joined uh, from afar by uh, Offa Bronstein in Tel Aviv from the International Centre for Peace in the Middle East. Offa, thanks for being with us. Uh, in Tehran, Syed Mustafa Koshisem, who's Professor of Journalism at the Fars Media Faculty, Applied Sciences University. We'll join you in a moment, sir. Thank you for being with us. And by Skype in Washington, Fatima Abu Alasra, Senior Analyst at the Middle East Foundation. Fatima, thank you very much for bearing with us. Let's now, if we can, go straight to Tehran and bring in Sayed Mustafa uh, Koshisem, who's the Professor of Journalism at the Fars Media Faculty. So I hope you can hear us and we'd be interested to know your uh, views uh, on what has happened and yeah. chiefly on the fact that the US is pointing the finger of blame at Iran uh, for this attack on the Saudi Arabian oil facilities. Hello and thanks for having me. Well, um, you know, uh, the claim has been raised against Iran uh, in the backdrop of so many lies that have been told about Iranian involvement in, and arms shipment to the Yemenis. We do remember that the, uh, the, the United States officials uh, were, uh, you know, raising similar claims about uh, the dispatch of uh, Iranian ballistic missiles or parts to uh, the Yemenis for quite a long time, and despite all the hilarious show uh, that was staged by Nikki Haley, uh, even NATO allies and many others uh, did not buy what they claimed in Washington. Um, but eventually, after the Yemenis stressed that they had purchased the, the ballistic missiles uh, over a decade ago under President uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the Russians confirmed the revelation. And uh, the, the Yemeni army also stressed that after purchasing the missiles, they had started tampering with and manipulating uh, the missiles, te the, the, those ballistic missile technology, in order to increase the range and the precision striking uh, by their defense engineers. Now, the same defense engineers have, according to Yemeni sources that have been stressing on that for quite a long time, they have changed uh, some primitive civilian drones uh, into military military ones for new objectives. Um, just the other night, uh, a military analyst, a Saudi military analyst, appeared on the Russian media to stress that all the sophisticated technology uh, and air defense shields that they have bought from the United States have failed to intercept these uh, Yemeni drones because they are primitive ones and they cannot be intercepted. So. 
altogether, the problem here is that the United States is raising claims without, again, without uh, any uh, shred of evidence to corroborate the claim. And also, this doesn't seem to be very much logical, since if Iran has equipped the Yemenis with this uh, uh, drones, then uh, uh, when had it done that? Uh, the country, Yemen, has been under a tight siege for quite a long time, for many years, and uh, uh, by a dozen nations who are assisted with uh, satellite imagery, data, sonar and radar technology of the United States. And uh, uh, how could Iran go through this siege? And this means uh, despise of uh, the United States arms production and arms manufacturers. Or maybe they claim that Iran had done that five years ago, four years ago, before the country so was I, can I uh, clarify, sir? under the siege. Then in that case, why didn't the Yemenis... So, can yeah, I clarify? Just, are you, are, but you are supporting, you are, su you are supporting uh, the, the Houthi rebels. Is that, that's this, correct, isn't it? I, I didn't get that. I'm sorry. You are supporting the Houthi rebels in Yemen. You, you arm the Houthi rebels. Is that correct? Sure. Uh, not the same way that we are supporting the Lebanese Hezbollah or the Palestinians. Iran has a stress that it's been rendering all types of support for uh, the Lebanese, Palestinians, Syrians, Iraqis, but uh, it has only been rendering spiritual support for the Yemenis. Even the Iranian Supreme Leader stressed a few months ago that the country is under a tight siege. Otherwise, we would have uh, sent uh, uh, the arms that they need, but we can't because the country is under a tight siege. Not even a small boat could go, could go through. So for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Let's get a reaction from uh, from Washington with Fatima Abu al Asra from the Middle East Foundation. Uh, Fatima, there's a report uh, in the Washington Post uh, which is saying that the uh, Saudis say that it was an Iranian weapon uh, fired uh, which actually did the damage. Uh, I don't know whether there's any comment you've got from there on that one or any thoughts. Have you listened to what our Iranian guest was saying? Um, I, I disagree with what he said, and I would... Um, I have I have a little bit more trust in the American intelligence uh, than he does, and also on the evidence that has been uh, uh, proven and and provided uh, previously, on terms of the uh, military links between the Houthis and Iran, and um, there has been weapons that have been intercepted um, and in the Arabian Gulf uh, that were coming to Iran uh, from Iran, and that was over the course of of this year. Um, definitely the ballistic missile is in the Iranian flagship, and that's something that the Houthis have taken advantage of. I think we're really at a stage where um, the Houthis themselves are not hiding this relationship uh, with the Iranian backers. Uh, Iran has even opened diplomatic uh, relationship with them and accepted the first um, ambassador uh, uh, from the Houthi rebels. So. Um, I can I, I understand uh, the persons in, in uh, your your guest in Tehran skepticism, but I think that um, uh, he might be completely misinformed uh, or just giving another totally different view. Uh, now, in terms of what the Saudis have said today about the um, about the attack, of course, you know, because of the general skepticism and because um, you know people are really wanting to know what exact evidence is there, I think the Saudis would also have to uh, provide um, uh, all of the evidence that really show that this is Iranian weaponry that has gone behind this. Of course, in the past, all of the uh, ballistic missiles and the drones that the Houthis have used um, have been also traced back to uh, Iranian manufacturing. And, and by the way, I would I would just have also more trust in the UN panel of experts report that has proved these links. So I, I, I would just focus on, uh, on that. Fatima, let me pause um, you there. I need to bring in Julian in the studio then often next. So Julian, you please. Yes, so uh, <clears throat> what we see uh, with the two interventions is that it's actually very hard uh, regarding what we call open source intelligence to know what is happening. Uh, perhaps some intelligence services know for sure if the weapon was Iranian or not. But actually, let's have a glance on uh, the That's security important. structure that uh, we have here. Because 
if we take all the things since a few weeks, we have seen some leaders saying that they can wipe out some countries from the face of the earth, and then after saying like, oh yes, of course, I, sh I can shake their hands. In that, I can join offer saying that actually, yes, there's this volatility that can goes from let's meet to uh, I will destroy your entire country. So we have this volatility, which is a, a problem. And in plus, it's not only between what we call classically between the countries, the hegemons, between the regional powers, but it's also throughout some groups. And al Shak al Ausat, the uh, Saudi newspaper, said today that, uh, of course, it's not the Tamil Tigers who did the attack. And if it is the Houthis, the Hezbollah, or, or the uh, pro-Iranian uh, uh, militias in Iraq, uh, it means that it is Iran. It's very hard to prove that from their point of view, or to dismiss that from the Iranian point of view, because they are aligned strategically, so they might have just get some uh, uh, incentives, some order, or just because they just wanted to do that, the Houthis. So, it's almost impossible to prove, but we see how one of the actors, even a small one, even if it's just one of the branch of the Houthis who decided to do that, because of the volatility and the unstable, unstable security structure, it can just go that, like that. And that is a very difficult and dangerous situation. Offer of Bronstein, wait for us in Tel Aviv. Over to you, sir. Well, once again, is it really important uh, 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 which weapon attacked whom. Uh, yesterday it was Iran, uh, a day before it was Saudi Arabia. Let's not forget that the Iranian regime is spending hundreds of millions in weapons. Let's not forget that the Saudi regime is spending hundreds of billions in weapons. Uh, the Iranian people are suffering. The uh, thousands and millions of foreign workers in the Gulf countries are uh, near to slavery. Uh, the Palestinian people in Gaza are suffering. The people of the Middle East are young, unemployed, and suffering. And those regimes, with the help of the Russian, of the American, of the Western world, are spending all their resources in weapons. One day, someone is going to ask what was for. While we know that global warming is eating uh, uh, the region, uh, the desert is taking over. In few years, we are going to witness millions of refugees coming from the uh, Middle East uh, to the north. We are going to have a humanita humanitarian crisis, and it's going to be terrible. Is it really important to know which weapon killed the womb? Do I need the expert from the intelligence to know that this is absolutely unacceptable if it's coming from Iran or if it's coming from the Saudis? What we need, it's true. Listen, is, uh, we know in Israel, and it's why the Israelis are attacking Iranian targets in the last few weeks in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Iraq, we know that the Israelis don't want an Iranian presence in the, in the Middle East. I am afraid that tomorrow, in two days, the Iranians are going to push the Hezbollah to attack Israel. Israel will respond. The Lebanese people are going to suffer from it. We don't know where it's going to take us, once and for all, while the challenges the nerve facing of global warging, of poverty, of ignorance in the Middle East, we are wasting all our resources in buying more weapons. In 10 years, in five years, we won't be forgiven. We won't be, it won't be forgotten, and it, we won't, we're not going to for be forgiven. I do believe that it's time for the Russian. You know, I'm, I'm very glad that the American president is barking, but he's not biting. I'm very glad that he asked Mr. Bolton to leave his office, knowing that the direction that he was taking, he was, taking was a very dangerous one, calling for a war, being very hard on, on, on the Iranian. And uh, Mr. Trump understood that it's not exactly Exactly, a year and a half before election in the United States, it's not exactly the direction he, he, he wants to go. It's time for the European, and very happy about the role that Mr. President Macron was playing and is playing in the last few weeks. It's time for the Russian, it's time for the European, it's time for the Chinese, it's time for the American to get together and to say, enough, it's enough. We need these resources for the well being of the people of the Middle East who are suffering. Billions of people are suffering. You know, everybody's talking on behalf of the Palestinians. 
one and a half uh, million Palestinians are living in a terrible situation in Gaza. Who is doing something about it? And we are, we are talking about in the, in, in the name of Palestinians. The Palestinian Authority is, is, is agonizing because we don't receive neither Israeli help, neither American help for the last, uh, for the last year. Who is doing something about it? What are we looking for? A catastrophe in the Middle East? An increase of the war in the Middle East? For hundreds of thousands of people to die in the Middle East? For us to wake up and to stop it? Enough, it's enough. It's time for the superpower, for the uh, uh, UN to get together and to stop it. Mark. Nobody knows what this war is for. Nobody knows what this war in Yemen is for. Offer Bronstein, I need to pause I, I, you I there. I really hope that we are going to wake up and stop it. Offer, I need uh, to pause so. you there. You've made your, 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 your yeah. point very, very forcefully and very clearly. We don't know what this war is for, talking about the situation in Yemen. And I think many people would share your point of view. Uh, I noticed Fatima uh, wanting to, to contribute there. Uh, before I bring you in, Fatima, before I bring you in, let me go first to Tehran to get a, a reaction from uh, Sayed Mustafa al Koshisem, who is still with us. Uh, Sayed, um, one is wondering what Iran actually wants. Uh, can you give us, uh, in, in a nutshell, what Iran wants out of this current situation? Well, uh, Iran has been stressing uh, very often that it wants peace. It encouraged the uh, Houthi Ansarullah movement to strike a deal, a uh, peace deal, and attend peace talks with the, with the Saudis. Uh, uh, when they were uh, uh, attending talks over the Hodeida port. Uh, the problem here is that the Saudis do not want to get rid of this quagmire that, is, that they have made, and they've been killing innocent people, and there is no one to stop them. Why has the United States sold them several hundred billions of dollars of arms? And uh, again, uh, they are in this region, and they are trying to increase the pressures on Tehran in order to force Tehran the under the sanctions, money. as well as the military threat, to take part in the talks. Another point here is the Israelis. Now, when we, when we think about the Israelis, what are they doing? They have been bombing not just Syria. Nowadays, they have been bombing the popular forces in Iraq. They are escalating the situation, unfortunately, and they are setting fire to the whole region. Remember, when Iran was under threat by the United States and shut down its hostile military drone, Hezbollah never pointed its missiles at Israel. It never bombed. Israel, it never launched it's any missile at Israel because true. Hezbollah, Palestinians, and others. They are, they are Iranian allies, not puppets or proxies of Iran. They never receive orders from Iran. They think for their own country's best interest, but they are allies of Iran, and Iran supports any movement that needs help when it comes under attack by uh, armies that are armed to the teeth. Syed, now, I need to Iran pause you there. Syed, I need to pause you there and bring in, in the other region. guest. Thank it's you, sir. Like I need to stop United you. States. Syed, thank you very much indeed. May, Fatima Abu al may, may, may say, over to you. Oh, sorry. May I say something? Quickly, you offer. Go, go ahead, off, and then you, Iran. Fatima. Offer first. May, I go would ahead. Like, I, would, I would like to address my, my Palestinian. I would Quickly, like to please. address my Iranian friend in Tehran. Quickly, please. I, I, I don't believe that our leaders, neither yours or ours in Israel, are going to do the right thing in the near future for the two people to get together. I want to remind you, one of the biggest Jewish community in the Muslim world is in Iran today, 25,000 Jews. One of the biggest uh, uh, Arab and uh, Jewish from uh, Muslim countries is in Israel. We have, we have a very big Iranian community. Maybe it's time for your civil society and my civil civil society to push our leader for negotiation, to push our leader for talking. Maybe it's time for you and for me to meet. Maybe it's time for artists from Iran and artists from Israel to meet. Maybe it's time for business people from Iran and business people from Israel to meet. Let's not wait for the politician. Let's take one step forward, because one day, as it was before, the Iranian and Israeli will have to live in peace. We love to live in peace. Let's do it, you and me, and also others who are behind us. Open invitation there to you, Syed. Have a think about that. Fatima, now let's hear from you. May I answer? Oh, Can okay. I have an answer? Okay, to go that? ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, please. Sorry, Fatima. Go ahead, Syed. Well, the, the problem here is that as long as the Israelis, as long as the Americans are killing people, not just Muslims, 
but non-Muslims, even uh, Jews and Christians across the region, they are bombing everyone. They are butchering Palestinians in Gaza. So that, so that has to stop, of course. they have been killing Iranian scientists. They are Iranian citizens. They're, of course, there won't be any kind of talks as long as you're living in houses that you've Why been don't killing you Palestinians, me? shedding their blood, and then kicking them out are of their land. And then me? Because you are, are you killing to also meet Iranians as so well. So answer his question, because will you meet with him often? Are you willing to meet Iranians. with me to end it? It's, it's an unfortunate fact are that you, you are still... Are you willing to meet with me you, to end you it? You have done not just killing you have done cyber attacks on Iranian facilities, not just nuclear ones, but also the infrastructure. About Stuxnet, this is man. what the it's Americans Iranian, have claimed. This is what the Dutch, the British, everyone is saying. They are doing every kind of harm. So you've, 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 you've answered, I think you've replied, although not answered the question. Let me pause that, you, sir. There won't be any hope for peace. Let me pause you. Let me bring in Fatima. Finally, Fatima, over to you. I'm sorry to take such time, but over to you, Fatima. Okay. That's all right. I, I completely... Uh, appreciate um, Mr. Offer's um, uh, Bronktine offer for peace. And, and I think this is where we should be heading for. If there is any escalation in the region, if there is any response uh, uh, from, from this administration uh, to uh, any response on Iran, the first that will be affected will be the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Yemenis, um, because there is just Iran's behavior has been completely unpredictable. And it has um, just used these threats very um, nonchalantly, I mean, to just attack right and left, because they know that the world is not ready for a response. Um, and I just want to say that in terms of thinking about peace, and especially in Yemen, as a Yemeni American myself, um, and as someone who advocated for peace, um, we we have given the UN envoy um, all, you know, the, the mandate, the power to talk to the Houthi rebels and to try to come into an agreement. And there isn't any action that they are currently taking where um, it serves the peace process. The escalation that occurred by the Houthis have coincided with the American sanctions on Iran. So there is no way that you can tell me that they are not acting as a proxy for Iran and to further their own interests. All what have the, the Houthis have been doing in terms of the escalations um, uh, inside Yemen and also on Saudi Arabia was was very dis, was was just coincided completely with with the um, rejection of the Iran deal by Trump and and so on and so forth. Um, there has been even further local fights within Yemen within the area of Dala where Houthis are trying to uh, go back and try to um, take areas that have been liberated. But they're so close to the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb, where, where I think they want to give Iran a, a way to control uh, the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb. So there are so many internal dynamics. Um, uh, Yemenis are being affected by every single decision that it's happening out there. Fatima and Abu every, Asra, I need, I need to wrap you up there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Offer Bronstein. Thank you to uh, okay. Syed Mustafa Koshesem, who's also joining us there from Tehran. Thank I would you. like to Thank meet my, my Iranian friend one day. Um, let's hope that will happen, <laughs> sir, and we'll be there to film it too. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. Time now for uh, our Media Watch. Yo, Joining myself and uh, Julian Theron here in the studio is uh, Emma James with Media Watch. Good evening. Um, do people feel this could be a sort of Pearl Harbor moment? Is, is that what we're seeing? We're seeing that phrase being bandied about quite a lot, not just from people who you might expect to be scaremongering about this. Um, the phrase that has got people worried is Donald Trump's uh, locked and loaded, which does imply that the US is very much ready to act right now. Um, of course, he has used that phrase before, so perhaps uh, people shouldn't be quite so, so concerned. Um, but looking at uh, the overwhelming uh, nature of reactions to this. People are uh, unsettled, to say the least. Um, so we're waiting for the Saudis to tell us, uh, to 
to tell you what the next move is. Are you serious? Asks this woman. Because Donald Trump really did appear to put the ball back in the Saudis' uh, court, saying that they were waiting to hear what they said about who they believed had carried out this attack. Um, America first means Saudi Arabia dictating US foreign policy. Nice, says this Twitter user. Uh, and this person saying, I thought we were done fighting the wars of other countries because it's expensive. Yet when someone touches a drop of oil, we're locked and loaded in a few hours. So a lot of different talking points coming up uh, on social media about uh, this particular issue. Um, with the National Security Advisor John Bolton gone, uh, some are asking questions about where exactly Donald Trump is getting his advice from now. Uh, this is a piece on the Media Matters website written by Matt Gertz, uh, which is very interesting, saying that basically um, the Fox and Friends news program shapes the president's world view and what he says from watching their output is that they are really pushing for something to be done about Iran. Um, some of the quotes from presenters include, I think this cannot go without retribution. They've provoked us before. What stops it from happening here? We've got to protect the world's oil supply. Um, now this writer says um, that it was very much Tucker Carlson who was among those credited with stopping Donald Trump, uh, bringing him back from the brink of acting against Iran last time around. And of course if there isn't somebody of that nature who he's listening to now, uh, you do wonder what will happen next. Now, the Saudis, of course, have said that, yes, the weapons uh, were from Iran, um, and they don't believe that they were fired from Yemen. Uh, so that leaves the door open to a little bit of conjecture as to where exactly they were fired from. Um, however, there's obviously a great deal of scepticism as to what uh, Saudi Arabia has to say. Uh, there's no reason whatsoever to trust either the Saudis or the Trump administration, so it's not clear what the average American citizen can possibly do with this information, says the journalist Seth Abramson. Um, looking at reactions in Iran, it's interesting to note that the Tehran Times isn't actually leading with this story um, on their website right now. They are on today in today's paper, but on their website they've pushed it down the running order a little bit, which perhaps says they're, they're trying not to add fuel to this particular fire. Um, they do have this article on their website, though, uh, where they say that um, the Americans' claims are both hasty and harmful to everyone. Uh, and they quote the Foreign Minister Mohammed uh, Javad Zarif, who tweeted uh, that having failed at maximum pressure, now the US was going for maximum deceit on this particular issue. Um, the Iran front page has a very different take, um, certainly seems to be ratcheting up the pressure here, uh, by reporting on the fact that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has said that US targets are within range of Iranian missiles. So that would very much be pointing in the other direction uh, that perhaps this is going to be escalated. Um, another thing that it's worth taking a look at is what the information that's coming out of Yemen, because of course the Houthi rebels still say that they were the ones who fired these, uh, who, who carried out these attacks. Um, and they have, have reported this. We are sure that we can reach whatever, wherever we want and at the time we determine. They are also ratcheting up the pressure with this particular video here, uh, which has been translated um, by the Middle East Media Research Institute, where they say there is more more to come, and they actually threaten Israel in this. Now, this particular channel, Al Mazira, was set up by the Houthi rebels, so this, it's very much their mouthpiece. So a lot of people ratcheting up the tensions, and uh, we will have to wait and see where this ends. Indeed, Emma, thank you very much indeed. Israel going to the, uh, to, to, to the, the polls tomorrow in their election, and obviously we'll be covering that uh, uh, at every point. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks to our guest, Julien Deron, here in the studio, uh, associate researcher at uh, Carib here in Paris. Thank you so very much for your thoughts. And uh, thanks to you for watching, too. Stay with us. More to come here. You're watching France 24.